Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you to Chung Hui and, and Joe for inviting me today. Um, I'd like to bring you a little closer to home, back to the UK and, and what we're doing here. Um, I've got a lot to get from this presentation, so I, I may end up speaking rather fast. So if there's anything you don't understand, just stick your hand up and out the pause, OK? I'd like to talk about a new initiative we've got um, called LED for Crops, uh, aiming to light, light up horticulture in the future. First of all, I better tell you what I'm going to tell you. That is, give a brief overview of SDC, who we are. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background uh, and the key national and global issues around future food production. But to be fair, we've covered a lot of that this morning, so I'm going to skip over that quite quickly. I'm then going to talk about the new LED facilities we've got in STC. And then if we've got time, I'll, I'll show you a few commercial applications um, uh, of where LEDs are being used in, in the horticultural sector. So SDC, we're an applied R&D <coughs> centre in, in North Yorkshire, uh, an ex-government facility that uh, went independent 10 years ago. The business established in 1950, 180 acres of uh, grey viable land uh, and three acres of glass houses. Uh, with full computer control using pre integrated computers. Staff of about 20 to 30 people delivering applied R&D, very much focusing on the applied R&D. Uh, working close with the, the UK industry. Um, <coughs> primarily focused on R&D and agronomy and, and crop protection issues, very topical with growers. But we do encourage collaborative research with, with science partners, including universities. Uh, and there's lots of opportunities there. And if you want more information, there's the website. Now, two key reports I'd like you to, to be aware of, at least. The first one is the future of food and farming. Challenges and Choices for Global Sustainability. Um, this is the final book of, of the Foresight Global Food and Farming Futures Project, which we reported in January 2011. The second one is a final report from the Commission on Sustainable Agriculture and Climate Change, more recent in March 2012. That's achieving food security growth in the face of climate change. And that really does start to focus minds and address, helps us to address some of the issues. So we saw this morning about uh, the world population growing. Uh, more mouths to feed, uh, and obviously the challenge um, to produce more food would be greater over the next 50 years than we ever faced before. What wasn't so much mentioned this morning is the impact of um, food scarcity in terms of global stability, or more importantly, global instability. When food is short, people start to riot. They don't want that happening too much. And the rising cost of energy. We all know it's happening, uh, no more so than growers who are having to face some fairly heavy bills for producing crops without any increase in prices for the produce. And this is the next big issue, of course, water. You wouldn't believe it, around the rain we've had in Yorkshire the last couple of weeks, but water is becoming an increasingly scarce resource and it's going to become more expensive. Is it sustainable to do what we're doing at the moment? Right. Here's um, a picture course, of, of uh, Google Earth looking down at the Almeria region of Spain. Near the, the ground, that's what it looks like. Is that sustainable? Somebody mentioned it this morning. This whole issue of embedded water. Now, we're, we're importing from these regions, uh, in the region of 80 90% water in this produce. Can we go on doing that forever when people in those countries are going to be showing water themselves? Again, I think most of these points have been covered. Um, the key point here is that the UK currently imports around about 6% of its food. Will that continue to be acceptable? And of course, in the future, who's going to be able to more afford that food that is produced? Will we be the richest nation in the world? I'm not so sure. So, food production is back on the agenda, and with it to desire for this latest government term, sustainable intensification. And what does it mean? Well, we've sort of touched on it, we've skirted around it this morning, but, but it's a simple appealing concept, and then Ian Crook, who, who is the chief scientist in AHDB on the levy, the levy board, Scientists. It's all about maximising food production efficiency in terms of external resource inputs, we heard about that this morning, and on the smallest necessary area of land. Uh, because given that definition, then multi tier cropping in an urban environment seems an ideal thing. <coughs> so the timing is right. Another one of the key questions here can LEDs 
finally unlocked the door. There's a cool light source. Remember here for the first time we built a really cool light source we can use. I mean cool, not in hit, but cool in terms of temperature. Um, to achieve success with these urban farming systems. And what's the ultimate potential of LED lighting? Given the broad range of plant species we grow. You know, each species will have a different response to the light. Uh, and how complex will light messages need to be in the future to get the maximum output from those crops? Probably the most important, and we just touched on just now, is, is how does the resource use efficiency stack up compared to conventional glasshouse production? I.e., we are asking the question, is it cost effective to do it on multiple layers? Or, does, or the, is the cost of input too great for the output? And what about the environmental attributes of urban farm systems? And what about mechanisation once you go into this multi-tier system? Because the labour costs are going to be massive in terms of handling crops at a height. So it's got to be mechanised somewhere. They're just questions to think about. Just getting back to LEDs, the <coughs> attributes of LEDs, well, that's then, the only one I really want to touch on there is really improving spectral control. Again, we've touched on it, this whole concept of, of creating light recipes to suit specific crop requirements. So each crop, the life of this, you'll need a specific light recipe for that crop. And we've always relied on the sun, but as we've heard this morning, at times the plant doesn't need that much light, and it certainly doesn't need all those wavelengths of light it's producing. So there's energy savings behind by giving it the right wavelength of light and specifically the right recipe. So lots of attributes that are a benefit to, to crop production. Now just now to talk about the LED crops facility. We've put the signs up, we haven't quite got the facility finished yet, but the intention is, is there. It's a collaborative initiative. Um, and our key partners are Philips, who provide the, the LED lighting, and Cambridge HOK, and I should say that Eric Janssen of Philips is, is here today, and Tim Howard from Cambridge HOK is also here in the audience. We're also working with the Farm Energy Centre at Stoneley, uh, because again, this, this, um, the energy use efficiency is important to us. We're also working with Lancaster University, because um, their expertise in, in plant responses to light, who has an eye for and more recently we, we've created a link here with Nottingham with, with Chumbri and, and um, Gerald because we've put a BBSSE application in to look at this whole question of resource use efficiency. <coughs> I've also got a, I'll talk about the Horticulture <coughs> Fellowship in the moment. This is STC, that's the glass house facility we've got. Um, about 50 compartments, uh, the largest is about 1,000 square metres. The one I'm pointing to there is um, two compartments, each one's 200 square metres in size. That's it on the ground, and you see there that it's been split. Half of it is now a glass house, and half of it is it's been turned into an insulated shed, an urban warehouse. No light penetration whatsoever. It's a bit like a building out of the moment, but it's getting there. Again, the signs are up. That's what it looks like. Just about a week ago, it looked like inside. So we've uh, cladded with uh, a combination of 100 mil kings on the roof and 80 mil on the, on the side walls, so it's thermally insulated very highly. And it needs to capture all the heat from the lights. We don't want to put any more heat input in. And as of yesterday, the, the, the light rigs and benches arrived, so as of today, they're starting to install um, the, the kit that we're going to use. If you want to ask more about that, then Tim's the guy to write at the back there. So we're almost there. Within two weeks, you should be up and running. Shouldn't it, Tim? These are the lights. These are Philips um, research modules. Deep red, blue, far red combination of those, very flexible, dimmable, switchable, allow us to create recipes for individual species. And they will be compared alongside Philips production, green power production modules, with or without the addition of far red research modules. So again, giving flexibility in the system. And the point about all this is we're trying to create a facility here that we can learn how to use these LEDs in a multi-tier array for grower benefit. Because it's all about getting the, the industry at a point where they can take this technology forward commercially. This is the intended layout of the, of the facility. So on the left here, sorry, on the left here, these are all research modules. Uh, each bench is uh, two meters long, four to six tiers high. Well, it will start with um, four layers of light. We've got potential with the height of building to go to six layers. Uh, so they're kitted out fully with research modules, so we've got effectively 4x4 four four factorial design to do some really nice experimentation with, with the lights. 
Here we've got Phillips Green Power production modules. These are three, three meter long benches, again, four tiers high. And these are the same, but with the far red research modules. So we can split depending on the crop we're growing, and then we manage the far, what they would, would they require far red or not. And these are experimental benches which I won't run on at the moment there. It gives an extra bit of flexibility. We had the first stewardship group meeting recently. Gerald, Gerald came to that meeting. Clearly, the lights hadn't been did at that point, but Tim kindly brought three of the units out of us so we could at least switch them on so the, the group could see what um, the intention is. But that's three out of, I think it would be 42 racks of lighting in there, so there will be some lights. I mentioned the Horticulture Fellowship, so we have been successful um, in winning an award, a five year fellowship award, uh, funded by HDC, East Morning Trust, and the Horticulture Trades Association um, to, to effectively employ a lighting specialist for the industry. Uh, that person will spend the initial six months training period at Lancaster University with Professor Nigel Paul. Um, and then follow that with men industry mentoring and, and the time at SDC in this facility. The job's been advertised, we've had numerous applicants, uh, some have been shortlisted, and there's a permanent job on position to the right candidate if we find one. I'll we'll have to wait and see. So, in terms of progress, it should be complete by the end of May, if not a little bit before, hopefully. Um, we're going to have to go through the initial validation period to ensure it functions properly. Uh, we'll have the formal opening, probably a ministerial opening, uh, around about July, depends on his diary, her diary. Um, <coughs> and we're currently exploring scientific and commercial opportunities to develop an, an innovative R&D program with LED lighting uh, and urban farming systems. Um, we need to get a better understanding of plant responses to light, there's no question about that, given the range of species we're dealing with in horticulture. Uh, we need to develop these light recipes. Uh, for specific crops and crop types, and we're working closely with FIPS in that regard, because they're obviously doing a lot of work worldwide in this area. Um, we need to look at the resource use efficiency aspects of, of urban production relative to conventional glasshouse cropping, because it's one thing going into a, a dark shed, you lose the, the uh, free solar light, but uh, you, don't put any, you don't put any additional heating costs in. And a lot of growers will be aware of the, the cost of heating. Uh, so it's trying to work out what that balance is and what the tipping point is. We clearly want to look at the potential mechanisation of this North Korean environment because the labour costs should be, will be um, and the practicality will be difficult to achieve without that. Um, and of course we want to look at the scope of pesticide minimisation once you start going in a closed building. Um, there's a lot of, lot of potential scope there because the, the retailers are looking for pesticide free produce. If we get the environment right, we shouldn't need to use many pesticides because we're in a contained building. We haven't got the same problem that we would have in a glass house or in a field situation. <coughs> the potential of R&D funding from various sources, including government, BBSRC, there's a recent um, proposal we've put it together with uh, Nottingham here was with this Horticulture and Potatoes Initiative. Uh, DEFRA is a bit broken at the moment, but uh, who knows what might change. The Department of um, Business Innovation Skills, TSB, provided up match funding, and others. And of course we've got industry through AHTB, the Levy Board and HTC. And we're getting a lot of commercial interest already. This, the facility is not finished yet, but we're already getting a lot of commercial interest from growers, retail clients. But that will have to be on a contract confidential basis. So we can't always talk about that. So what about that's what we're doing. So we're just kickstarting a program of work in the next few weeks, and if anyone's interested in joining on that, then please talk to me or my colleagues. But what's happening elsewhere uh, in, in terms of commercial uptake with LED lighting? Well, probably the, the biggest growth area at the moment is, is the high wire crops, things like tomatoes, cucumbers, um, which don't really lend themselves to a, a tier system. Um, but here we're looking at um, it's quite a few commercial pilot studies with, with interlighting. I'll show you some progress at the moment. Um, propagation units, I think this is where this multi tier system would really kick off to start with. We're already seeing that happen. Small scale commercial application through the early adopters, people trying it and things like it. And then the low crops, um, you know, the, 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 the leafy salads, the herb crops, the bedding plants, etc. Small scale, single or dual layer or multi tier systems have been tried by the early adopters at this stage, but on a relatively small scale. 
starting with the interlighting, this is um, the crop of tomatoes that um, the cropping group sent in Bleistein in Holland. Um, they've actually lifted the lights up here so you can see them, but these would normally be dropped into the low part of the canopy here. Uh, these are Philips uh, green power production modules being trialled there to see um, how they can improve the, the closer they capture low down the canopy of the crop, which often gets quite dark. And there is um, yield increase that potential there uh, between uh, anything from 5, 10, to believe all the stories, 15 percent. Some improvements. Orchid growers in this case and Jack in Holland, uh, conventional production on rolling benches. But this particular grower has installed a small building, an insulated building within his greenhouse, <laughs> and put in a series of, of I think it's seven layers of LEDs again from the Philips. Um, and to be fair, these were the Philips photographs because I went on the Philips tour to Holland two or twice, so um, but they are the market leaders with this sort of area. And this is this is sort of my weaning and micro crop, so it's not quite a bit to what a lot of our growers want to do. But you can see how it's starting off. Um, this surprised me, a tulip grower in Holland, famous for the tulips, um, growing hydroponically in a, in a warehouse, stacked vertically with irrigated from and cascading the water down. But this guy's invested in a, in a, a substantial greenhouse structure on three layers. Very high, mm -hmm. and the bottom two, I think it's one two layers there, if you've got early Philips LEDs in the bottom two layers. Yeah. And the whole thing's mechanised so the crop moves up towards the light when it gets to, when it gets to flowering. Well, that's a massive investment, so he's, he's a convinced that it's, it's the right way forward. Um, then a Kalankoa grower, or what do you call them, Eric in Poland? Kalancho. Kalancho. We call them Kalankoa. Anyway. Um, this grower, interestingly, has actually put a, another mobile bench under his existing bench and kitted that out with LEDs there. And this crop's coming out a week earlier than the conventional crop on the top. And he's seeing it how it's rooting. It's rooting quicker under LEDs than with conventional production. Question him, of course, does he now put more layers in on the vertical plane, or does he do more of that across this whole nursery? That's an interesting decision for him. I know it's where I go, but whether we will or not, I don't know. Because the ultimate, of course, is uh, something like this. This is a firm production of Vitro Plus, again with Philips uh, support here, um, where they've got, now got 16 layers of LEDs producing some effective micro crop and weaning of ferns. Prior to this, they were using fluorescent tubes. They've switched to LEDs throughout uh, and were very successful. But that is typical in urban farm situation we will see developing commercially for a whole range of crops in the future. Subject the economics. Uh, in terms of edible crops, that, well, there's one handful of edible crops. This is um, a couple of guys in the uh, Bernard district of the Netherlands growing um, conventional lettuce, fairly standard product. But they've seen the light, as it were, to be the pun. Uh, and is this a city model, city farming model for the future? I think they commenced production this month. And they've got seven layers of uh, lettuce production under LEDs mainly the propagation area than the moving out to the commercial production. Um, but you can see where it's going. This is just a start. Just a reminder of the potential benefits of urban farming. How am I doing the time? Are we okay? Things have not been mentioned here, and it's very, very important for growers, is that if you're going to close a building, there's no interference with the weather. So like today, when the sun's gone in, your crop is put back. So scheduling is a big issue for growers. A lot of growers just find the major retailers. Uh, and it's a classic example with the ornamental sector at the moment. We've had a crack spring, uh, and this stock piling up at nurseries uh, because nobody wants to buy it. That's a massive scheduling problem and cost to growers because they can't afford um, not to sell it. But that's all because of the weather. The weather is not, it's not any typical, let's say. Nobody cares typical, I'm not sure. Um, but it is a problem. And if you move into a, in a closed warehouse system, you can do it economically, it takes away that worry about the weather. It's the only thing we've not been able to control so far. And of course, you can help the system, as we heard this morning, from using PV panels to um, help drive them. Of course, you wouldn't necessarily grow this property on the day. If you're in a closed building, it doesn't matter. You grow it at night when electricity is cheaper. There's all sorts of ways of reducing the cost. Probably one of the key drivers is this whole question of, of local production, um, growing cities. Not necessarily in the middle of the city, but you know, 
Well, it's all about reducing your road miles and, and looking at import substitution to avoid importing all this water. And of course, the potential for urban production and co-location with major retailer distribution hubs, for instance. That's probably where it's going to start. I haven't really touched on this much, but you know, we mentioned water at the start. Um, because these systems are growing in, in closed hydroponic systems, in our case that we're using urban flood, which I mentioned earlier, the urban flood based system, um, there's a significant saving of water in the region 90% compared to conventional cropping. Um, so, so that's going to help considerably. And obviously, as well as the water, you save the nutrients as well, which you've got nutrient cycling. That helps us reduce our carbon footprint, which is going to become more and more important as we progress. And of course, the other issue that's been certainly for the food crops is this whole question of biosecurity. Some of you in, in Europe have been aware of the, the big issues last year with, with, with the E. coli, <coughs> the food poisoning bugs, um, and that's all because we're growing crops in a, in a bit of a, an exposed environment. <coughs> if you move indoors into a closed system, uh, you reduce or eliminate that exposure to, to uh, the likes of E. coli, and therefore the, the people buying your produce should be much happier. So that's a summary. I'm not going to go through it all. I'll stop there and uh, end up for questions. Of one of the colleagues was talking about. We can do anything in green wash in architecture, 
and we can tell a lovely story about it. To actually have an impact on on world food, it can't just be green wash fluffy. It has to be commercially viable because the retailer at the end of the day will start to say, oh, that's jolly good. So you could supply me for a lower cost, can you? <laughs> okay, and that will be our challenge as well. So, or we have to get the retailers interested in growing it themselves. Yeah, but the retailer wants to have the year around the production. British growth, that's yeah. the demand. Yeah, that's actually right. They, they want year round production. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the more they can produce that locally, the better. You take an example of the lettuce grow. Conventionally, at the moment, you'll produce maybe six crops a year in a glass house in scrub soil. It goes to hydroponics, puts a bit of heat in, it can grow maybe seven, eight pushing to nine crops. Yeah. What we've done now is once you start putting LED lighting in uh, and growing 12 months a year at constant temperatures, then you know, what is the potential? We don't know, but I'm guessing it's going to be 12 or 13 crops a year. Maybe. So then the economic balance shifts again, particularly when you've got multiple layers. Um, and we're getting heat from the lights. That's obviously the cost, because it's, it's waste heat in a sense. Uh, but you know, we've got to bring all those into equation to work it out, and that's one of the reasons Lake of Nottingham to actually start to answer some of these fundamental questions. Because until we've got that answer, we don't know whether it's a three year payback or a five, six year payback. And obviously, and the other thing that's critical in all this, the reason we've committed to it is that you know, we're jumping in now. Um, shut your ears a minute, please, Eric. But, but it's like an LED, the price of LED lights are going to come down because of competition. Uh, more, as more manufacturers come on board, um, same applies with photovoltaic panels, the price of those has already come down, they'll come down to it, and it also the efficiency will improve, will get better. So we're, we're starting at a, at a low point, but it will, get, it will improve over time. And when, when that is, I don't know, but you know, it will change. I may retire, I don't know. I'm certainly aware of that, and uh, it's, just, it's just your assessment that it's you know, more end at this point. I certainly think at the moment we've got to stack other things up other than just that to make it make sense. Yeah. But, but if I was a grower, I'd be starting small, doing what that orchid grower did, putting a small unit, he's got, he's got an existing glass house anyway, yeah. he's heating it anyway, he can put a small unit in there, just get a feel for these lights, and expand it when he wants, but effectively the propagation stage is where to go, the, the lettuce grows on the same. That to me is, is the starting point, it'll grow from there. Yeah, there yeah, you talked about um, developing light recipes, but for the facility at Stockbridge, is it standard, or are you there going to be looking at? Uh, we, we will do what uh, is asked of us by the clients, um, and part of that will undoubtedly be from the feedback we're getting already, will be the requirement to create light recipes using this, these uh, um, research modules from Philips, where we can actually dim them, um, so we can get complete balance between the far red, deep red, and blue. So we, we can mix and match those fully to get exactly the right recipe for a crop and potentially change it during the life of that crop. Because you know, mm -hmm. when it's vegetated it'll need a different light than maybe when it's when it's sort of bedding plant when it starts to flower or, or you get flower initiation. So we can start to change things around. Same you know the, the influence on rooting has surprised me. But you know, you see the effects that we wouldn't anticipate. And I'm sure that will happen more and more. We'll see a lot of effects we haven't anticipated. And do we um, do we know the the light response for stomatal opening? It would be interesting to play with that uh, versus the light response. Yeah, I don't know the answer, I'm not a plant geologist, but I'm sure people will yeah. know. Certainly, Nigel Four is uh, yeah. bringing yeah. that sort of expertise yeah. to the group as well. And that's really where the, the fellow is also going to be working with good plant geology background. That's right. So we've set it up so every single layer that looks at the is is 42 in total. Every single layer has its own individual control for a central processing unit. And the, as a result of whatever light levels we're running, and then which combination we're running on each bench, we're able to track and calculate the energy into that bench. So for every recipe replication, we've got a timing, we've got a micromole level, and an energy consumption. And then we've got Martin's bit at the end, which is the analysis of the results. So we put all that lot in the mix. And it's driven by a, a stewardship group that are very commercial. Uh, it's represented by all the, on represented by the group of all the chairmen of the various coffee associations, like cucumbers, bedding plants, herbs, etc. 
They're all represented, so they'll be ensuring that we, we get it right. I hope. Can I ask you, um, have you sold your vegetables to Tesco yet? Have we? Sold your vegetables to Tesco. What, at SDC? Yeah. Uh, well, no, we don't, because we have, we've always had a policy of not doing, um, because that means we're then competing with our own industry. So we, we avoid marketing any produce from the site, but the horticultural glass house produce, um, because it means we are competing and that wouldn't be right. So, and to be fair, a lot of produce we, we uh, generate isn't fit for market because I'm killing a good disease because I'm a good person. You could be very interesting to look at the water quality required. Yeah. Well, I think that will be, and, and again, it's something that I'm sure we'll learn a lot from once we get this facility to be running, because shelf life is a major issue. And, and I think we'll see some very fascinating effects of the, the lighting regime we've given on shelf life. And that's one of the things that, I mean, we haven't, we haven't evolved the retailers yet, but uh, it's not going to be long before we will be doing it. Then we'll see. Any more questions? No? Okay. Oh, yeah, one more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just on your last point there about the retailers um, and involving them, do you not think by doing so you're selling yourself up for the <laughs> Because you, you talked about possible. Because I define involvement. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that we need to have them on board in some way. I'm keeping a very open mind as to how we keep them involved. Um, if they suddenly came up with a million pounds and want us to sponsor them, then that's a different uh, question, of course. I think that's unlikely. Uh, but we need them on board because ultimately that's where the produce will be going, that the growers produce, and we need to make sure that the the whole way we process technology is handled right because we don't want um, another GM scare, you know, Frankenstein foods developing because we're growing them artificially. Okay. We've got to sell this story to, to the um, general public and the retailers correctly uh, because we are fiddling with light. So we need them, we need them on board on a positive, positive way. I, I agree. You, you're but you're talking about a completely different way of producing food. Mm. I think because of things that have been touched on here, we maybe need a different way of marketing food. Yeah. We're going to need the retailers, no question. But that doesn't mean you have to go in cheaper. But they may say that. That's something that's different. It's different, 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 different. The difference that I've had with one leading retailer um, was that they're fully behind it. I mean, they are aware of LED technology and there's some growers in here today who will be being challenged by their technical managers from their retailers to say what are you doing on it so they are aware of it what we've got to do is channel that information into them and this leading uh, technologist that i spoke to said but what it needs to do tim it needs to come on the back of reduced pesticide input to do pgrs because that's the positive story that goes behind the, that helps explain the technology don't bring it to me with residues yeah, the same residues or the same use of PGRs. If you get rid of those or reduce those at the same time, then that's past the positive story. But and the stewardship meeting the other week, it was raised that we need to be careful how we do handle yeah. the, the PR side of what we are trying to do. Yeah. All automated production facilities, <coughs> as co-location facilities, to uh, major retail distribution hubs, you know, owned by the retailers <coughs> at the end of farmers and growers, isn't it? At least, we'd argue that. It certainly could be. It's more yeah. interesting than don't be. Yeah. They are highly likely. I don't think they are. It's hard the technology to be gross. There is. Still need to have a grow. Can Eric just comment on how Walmart in America? Can you hear me? Because they're actually a little further away. Walmart is having a contract in New York for a next to the division shipping center, but they're not owned by Walmart. Walmart is just saying we're going to pay X price for three years on their own. And they're still a grower involved, of course. Right. Thank you very much.